Our first reading, again with the theme of love from 1 John, it says this. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. And this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. And this, this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if you love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. This is God's word for us this morning. I invite you to rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Gospel this morning is actually the Christmas story told by John. In John chapter 1, it says this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. And in him was life, and the life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now he came as a witness to testify concerning the light, so that through him all might believe. Now he himself was not the light, but he came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world, and, and he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet, to all who did receive him, to those who, who had believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children, born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is God's word for us. You may be seated. God's grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As we approach the task of preaching, let's bow our hearts and heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray that your spirit is present and active among us, that he would open up our hearts, our eyes, our ears, and our minds to you and your word, that through your word we may see your loving heart for us in Christ. We ask this all in the name of your Son, our Savior. Amen. An el elderly couple lay in bed one night. They had been married for 67 years. But, but there was a chasm that formed in their relationship, and, and the wife felt it that night as they lay on opposite sides of the, the bed. The wife decided to speak up. And she said, do you remember when we were young and you used to hold my hand at night? She heard her husband sigh and then felt her husband's hand come and grab hers. She waited a few more seconds and she spoke up uh, again. She said, do you remember when we were young and you used to hold me all night? She heard her husband sigh and then felt him roll over in the bed and hold her. She waited a few more seconds and she spoke up again. She said, do you remember when we were young and you used to nibble my ear? At that point in time, she heard her husband let out the biggest sigh yet. 
And he dramatically just got out of bed and left. And she said, honey, why are you leaving me? So he said, leaving? I'm not leaving you. I'm going to get my teeth. <laughs> now, funny or not, it serves a point, okay? We are in our fourth and final week of our teaching series here at St. Peter's that we've been calling Wish List. The big idea behind it is, is this, is, is that you and I have been curating wish lists through the month of this December. And, and I don't know what's on your list, but my guess is that it's pretty cemented in, right? Seeing how Christmas is just a week away. Now, I don't know, maybe you have one of those cool new VR headsets on your list, right? That would be cool. Maybe you have some of those, those new pillow sandals, those really thick slides that you see people wearing. Maybe those are on your list, right? Maybe you're somebody that says, I don't want any of that. Just give me a big, fat, big, fat thick stack of gift cards, and I'm good, right? I don't know what's on your list, but it's also true that you and I have deeper wishes. Wishes that, that, that no Amazon fulfillment center could bring to us. And as we've been gathering and as we've been journeying towards Christmas as the body of Christ as St. Peter's, this Christmas we say we have four wishes. We wish that people have hope, experience peace, find joy, and are be loved. And this being the fourth and final week, we're looking at that last one of love. And, and we're looking at it through the lens of intimacy. Now, my guess is that when I say that word, you kind of, your, your mind kind of goes to the end of that joke, right? Somebody nibbling somebody else's ear, right? That's kind of where our, our, our minds go. But, but we're not talking about that today. We're looking at it through a different lens. You see, I think it's important as we start here to, to actually stop, to pause and recognize that all of us, like if you have a pulse in here, all of us come with some baggage to the word in intimacy. Maybe, maybe you're with somebody who, has, who, is, who is manipulating in intimacy, forcing intimacy, or vacating intimacy, right? We all, in, in some way, come with some amount of baggage with the word intimacy. But my ask this morning is, is that you hang with me through the message as we kind of look at it in a different lens. In order to get the most out of our time this morning, I think it's important to start with some big, broad, sweeping definitions of what the word intimacy means. So this, this morning, our working definition of in intimacy includes two things. Being intimate means that you are fully known and fully accepted. Again, fully known and fully accepted. Now, as we go through this life, there's kind of some subcategories to this big, broad definition of intimacy. There's several. For example, one of them, there's spiritual intimacy. That's a subcategory of this whole broad definition of intimacy. And spiritual in intimacy is, is where you desire to be fully known and fully accepted by the creator of the cosmos, by the divine, by God himself. Now, one of the ways that God has set that up to work in this world, not the only way, but one of the ways that God has set this up to, to work is in worship, right? In worship, we gather Sunday in, Sunday out, Saturday in, Saturday out, Thursday in, Thursday out. We gather to receive the gifts that God gives to us, right? We receive grace and mercy and forgiveness. We receive hope and peace and joy and love. One of the gifts that God gives to us in worship is spiritual intimacy. And, and we're going to kind of coin it to, to, today by saying this, that we all wish that we were intimate with the infinite. 
the infinite being God, right? We're intimate with the infinite. Now, there's several other subcategories that we can talk about, but, but the other one to hit on this morning is relational intimacy. And relational in, in, intimacy is that we are fully known and fully accepted by others, right? We all have a desire to be fully known and fully accepted by other people. Now, one of the ways that that works in this world, not the only way, but one of the ways that this works in this world is through sex sexuality, right? And that's kind of usually where our brains go to. But this morning, hang with me, because we're going to be looking at intimacy through the lens of spirituality. That is spiritual in intimacy. The University of Kansas kind of did a, a research project on this. It was fascinating. Um, they put this group to, together to answer this question. How long does it take to become BFFs, right? Best friends forever. How long does it take to become best friends? And, and they put this group to, together, and they surveyed over 500 people. And they gathered their re results and they kind of laid out kind of their top three findings. And their top three findings were this. Um, in order to become what they called a casual friend, which is what we would say is an acquaintance, in, in order to become an acquaintance, you need to spend 50 hours, five zero, 50 hours with someone. 49 hours, stranger. 50 hours, you get to become an acquaintance. Now, to make, to make that next step up is, is what they called friend, right? It wasn't an acquaintance. It wasn't the best friend, right? It was just a friend. In order to become a friend with somebody, you had to spend somewhere between 80 to 100 hours with them. In order to obtain the highest level, right, best friend, right, the highest level of intimacy between friends, in order to be BFFs, you had to spend somewhere around 200 hours with someone else. The point? Intimacy is developed over time. You see, that it, it explains why, and this was kind of the point of their research, it explains why perhaps you, you went to college or was around the college years, right? That is why college kiddos become such good friends so quickly, right? Because they are literally spending every waking hour with someone, right? You get up to those 200 hours really quick. But it also explains if you tra transition out, out of those college years and, and, and you're into your young adult years, right? And you're getting into your career and your profession and then maybe you start dating somebody and that dating somebody became significant, right? And that significantness worked to be an engagement and then you got married and then maybe you had some kiddos and those kiddos grew up and now they're in sports and everything else, right? That explains why it's perhaps harder to make friends the older that you get. Because you don't have as much time to invest in people because you got a lot of other responsibilities running around. You need to make sure that everybody survives the day, especially with little ones, right? The point, intimacy is developed over time. Now, my guess, my guess is that you didn't come to worship this morning thinking, hmm, am I intimate with the infinite, right? My guess is that that was not your waking question when, you, when your eyes popped open this morning, and that's okay. But here's, here's what I'll argue this morning, is that what, that's what really, that's really what we're all gearing after. We all want to be intimate with the infinite. And you, you know, we, we see that as we read Scripture, right? Genesis 1 and 2 were in, introduced to Adam and, and Eve, right? Adam and Eve were those first humans that walked the earth. Man, they had intimacy with God in all its fullness, right? They were intimate with the infinite. They were literally dwelling with 
God far over 200 hours, right? They would take walks with him in the cool of the morning. They never thought at any point in time, hmm, I wonder if God knows the real me, right? They never thought to themselves, hmm, can I let my guard down in front of God? Those questions never crossed their mind because they were experiencing intimacy with God. Now, the problem, problem comes with Genesis 3 and sin. When sin enters the, the world, it severs their intimacy. When sin in, in, enters the, the world, they become distant with one another. It's kind of like, I'll give you this metaphor this morning, it's kind of like um, when sin in, entered the world, the lights got turned out on Adam and Eve. And they spent the rest of their life fumbling around in the dark, trying to figure everything out. The problem with the dark and holding such a beautiful and delicate gift as intimacy, you're bound to trip. You're bound to let intimacy fall, and it's bound to shatter everywhere. Do you have china in your house? Like, maybe you're someone that's like, I'm not fancy enough for China, right? Maybe your parents have China, your grandparents have China. I don't know, but my parents have China. They have Christmas China. It comes out about twice a a year. It's a Linux set. I can't imagine going to get those 12 plates in the dark, in the dark where you can't even see the, the hand in front of your face. I can't imagine going to get those plates and trying to bring them to the table, especially in my house, because I'm bound to trip on something. I'm bound to step on a Lego. And if you've ever stepped on a Lego, right, you know those those plates are going flying, you're holding your foot, you're hopping around, you're saying, ouch, right? Imagine that was you. Imagine those plates shattered. And imagine... Somebody asked you to put them back together again in the dark. The best possible outcome for for this, the best possible outcome that you could have is that you could put it together in a way that maybe, maybe barely resembles the original. You've got cuts on your hands, glue on your hands, and the plates barely resemble the original gift. That's what's happened with intimacy. We've been fumbling around in the dark trying to put it back together, and when we do put it back together, it barely resembles what God intended it for. You see this kind of play out as you continue reading Scripture. As you get out of Genesis 1 and 2, uh, you have Adam, Adam and Eve, you have Noah, and then you come to this, this, this place where they're building a tower, right? If you've ever been in Sunday school, you might have heard this. It's the Tower of Babel, Tower of Babel, right? They build this tower. They get it so high. They're trying to build this tower so they can reach back up to God, so they can again dwell with God, They're trying to regain what was lost in Genesis 1 and 2. They're trying to regain intimacy with God, but they're going about it in all the wrong ways. You see this play play out also if you go into the New Testament. There's a time that the disciple Peter is walking up a mountain with James, John, and Jesus. And, and, and he's walking up this mountain, and all of a sudden, Jesus is transfixed in all his glory. We call it the Mount of Transfiguration, right? Jesus is transfixed in all of his glory, and Peter has this beautiful line. I love this from Peter. Peter says, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Peter recognizes that this might be the closest moment that humanity has ever gotten to getting back Genesis 1 and 2, right? And what does Peter say when, when, when he sees it, when he experiences it, when it's his reality? He says, Lord, this is good. And he goes on to say this, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. 
because Moses and Elijah appear out of nowhere, having been dead for like thousands of, of years. They're with them, with Jesus. Peter's like, you get a tent, and, and you get a tent, and you get a tent, and I am ready to spend the rest of my life here because it is good. If you can kind of continue reading through the story, Jesus actually chides Peter a little bit for this. Again, as good as, as, as it is, he's looking for it in all the wrong places. And 2,000 years later, you and I continue to look for intimacy in all the wrong places. If, in, if intimacy is being fully known and fully accepted, if you think those projects that come across your desk that you get to sign off on and your name gets to be, be there, if you think that those are going to make you fully known, you're looking for intimacy in all the wrong places. If you think your children's accomplishments, right, their academic accomplishments, their sports accomplishments, their drama accomplishments, whatever it is, if you think that your children's accomplishments are going to make you fully known, you're looking for it in all the wrong places. If you think that 401k is going to make you fully accepted, you're looking for it in all the wrong places. If you think that beautiful picture that you decided to put on Insta, you're, you cur curated it, it is gorgeous. If you think that's going to make you in that inner circle and make you fully accepted, you're looking for it in all the wrong places. We continue to look for intimacy in all the wrong places. There was a book written in 1945, The World, the Flesh, and Father Smith. It was, it's a fictional book, but it's really about pastoral care, right? How do pastors provide care for their people? It was written in a fictional way. Kind of towards the end, end of the book, Father Smith comes across this young uh, adult who has, according to her, her own con confession, a hyper view of sex sexuality. And, and this, this young adult has always wanted to talk to a pastor about se sexuality and, according to her, the church's antiquated view of it. But she has this, this wonderful line. She said, I've always wanted to talk to a pastor about this, but... Pastors don't hang out in the places where I am. They go on to have this conversation about sex, sexuality, and it's kind of summed up, and then this young adult says this, says, I think that religion is a really poor substitute for sexuality. Because according to her eyes, religion was trying to control it all. And Father Smith kind of stood there for a second and, and thought and said, well, you know, that's in interesting because I think the exact opposite. I think that sexuality is a poor substitute for religion. And then he has this famous phrase, this is kind of what the book is known for, has this famous phrase, Father Smith says, says this, I still believe the young men, I still believe the young man who knocks on the door at the brothel is unconsciously looking for God. Again, I still believe the young man who knocks on the door at the brothel is unconsciously looking for God. That's a fictional story. But this very real Lutheran pastor up here thinks that he's getting exactly what we're talking about. You and I, we look for intimacy in all the wrong places. You may not have come this morning and, and wondered, hmm, am I intimate with the infinite? But it's really what all of us are gearing after. I don't know what you bring this morning, right? I don't know if you are somebody who, who is with somebody that's, 
that is with you that is manipulating or forcing or vacating intimacy. I don't know if you're the one who's manipulating, forcing, or vacating in intimacy. I don't know if you've been knocking on doors. I don't know if you've been trying to build towers. I don't know if you've been on mountains. I don't know if, if you're into, into over-drinking or if you're into overeating. I don't know if you think about your sin and dwell on it all the time or you try to push it to the outskirts of your mind so you don't have to. I don't know where you are, but I know this. Christmas is the key to spiritual in intimacy. Christmas is the key to being intimate with the infinite. We read it in the Christmas story in John chapter 1. Now, John doesn't have all the characters, right? He doesn't have shepherds, he doesn't have wise men, he doesn't have sheep, uh, he doesn't have Mary, he doesn't have Joseph, he doesn't have baby Jesus, actually. He doesn't have a manger. But what John does have is that he gives us a beautiful description of what happens because of Christmas. John says this, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Point of verse 1, the Word is Jesus. Jesus is with God. Jesus is God. Verse 2, He was with God in the beginning. Point, Jesus has always been with God since eternity. Verse 3, through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. The point, Jesus was there at creation making things. Verse 4, in Him Jesus was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. Jesus gives us life. Verse 5, the light shines in the darkness. The darkness that came through sin, that darkness that you and I are fumbling through trying to figure our way out, Jesus is the light. And you know what? No darkness has or will ever overcome it. And then John says this, and this is kind of what John's famous for. He says, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. That word dwelling, that is a direct link back to Genesis 1 and 2. That's a direct link back to what you and I lost in Genesis chapter 3. It's a direct link to what people were gearing after when they were building that big temple. It's a direct link back to what Peter was desiring on the mountain. It's a direct link back to the man who's looking for it at the brothel. It's a direct link back to you because God knew that we couldn't dwell with him so he came to dwell with us and y'all he dwells with us for much more than 200 hours because of Christmas you are fully known and fully accepted by God, you are intimate with the infinite. Let me close our time and our series off telling you this story. I was reading that classic Christmas book, or one of the classic Christmas books, to my kiddos on Tuesday night. Uh, it, was, it was this book. It was The Grinch, right? You know those Grinches in your life, right? Those people who don't like Christmas music, those people who don't like movies, those people who don't like decorations, those people who don't like Christmas cheer at all. Or maybe it's not that they don't like it, uh, but they could just really care less, right? You know the Grinches in your life. The original story is about actually an outcast who has nobody to dwell with him. The only person he's living with is a dog called Max. Nobody's clocking those hours with the Grinch, right? Getting to 50, getting to 80, getting to 200. And the Grinch, man, he looks for intimacy in all the wrong places. He looks for it in the Christmas music, the Christmas movies, the Christmas decorations, the Christmas food. But the great thing about the Grinch 
is that he has this turning at the end of the book, right? He turns from despising Christmas to adoring Christmas. Why? At the end of the book, one of the who's down in Whoville invites the Grinch in. And the time starts. They start clocking, trying to get to those 50 hours, trying to get those 80 hours, trying to get those 200 hours. The whole book ends. The last page is the Grinch cutting the who roast beef. Y'all, we are about to get into the busiest week of the whole calendar year. But do you know what else it, it is? It's also the loneliest week of the whole calendar year for a lot of people. Who can you invite to your Christmas table this week? Who can you start that timer and start because God has given you intimacy with God. It's yours. It's secure through the whole Christ event. His birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension. It's yours. Nobody can take it from you. Who can you turn and give that gift back to so that people can have hope, experience peace, find joy, and be loved. Come soon, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.